In January of each year, the eyes of the hundreds of millions of tennis fans around the world become glued to their screens. As the world watches some of the greatest tennis drama unfold live in Melbourne Park, Australia. The Australian Open is one of the four Grand Slam tennis tournaments held every year, which runs in the second half of January and kicks off the annual tennis calendar. The rest of the Grand Slams then follow between the months of May and September, and together they help determine the strongest tennis players in the world in any given year. But putting the on-court performances and tennis rankings drama aside, how do the Grand Slam tournaments work from a purely business perspective? And why do people say that tennis is a broken sport? Stay tuned as we review these and other related questions in this video. The main attraction and source of prestige of the Grand Slams stems from the fact that they are some of the longest-running professional sporting events in the world. To give you an idea, Wimbledon was founded in 1877, or more than 145 years ago. The other three are not far behind, with the U.S. Open starting out four years later in 1881, the French Open ten years after that in 1891, and the Australian Open being the last one to the scene in 1905. In comparison, Tour de France's first race didn't take place until 1903. The 24 Hours of Le Mans endurance race started out in 1923. The first FIFA World Cup was not held until 1933. Formula One was first founded only in 1950, and the first Super Bowl was only held in 1967. Perhaps only the modern-day Olympic Games are the closest major rival to the Grand Slams, in terms of their longevity having been held since the first games in the new format of 1896. Besides their historical heritage, Grand Slams are the most economically successful tennis events in the world today. One way to measure this is to look at the tournament's prize funds, as they are usually determined based on how much money the event as a whole is able to generate through its various income streams. The total pool of prize money available to participants in the 2023 edition of the Australian Open is reported to be around $50 million US, of which the winner is eligible to receive close to $3 million. Similarly, prize funds for the US Open, the French Open, and for Wimbledon for 2023 are all expected to be in the $50 to $60 million range. What's interesting is how the prize funds are distributed. As an example, the 2022 French Open featured a total of 128 men's and 128 women's singles players and further participants in the tournament's other events, such as the men's, women's, and mixed doubles, boys' and girls' events, and the wheelchair competition. The overall prize fund is the first allocated by the type of event, with men's and women's singles receiving the lion's share of the overall budget. Within each event, prize money is further divided based on how far a given player or team of two players is able to advance in the tournament. The topic of prize money allocation has been a contentious issue in the world of tennis for many years now. The main reason for this is the widely reported fact that out of the roughly 3,000 ranked men's and women's players in any given year, only a relatively small percentage are able to make a living from playing tennis professionally. Players ranked outside of the top 200 often struggle financially as they have little to cover their own tournament participation expenses, including coaching and physiotherapy fees, accommodation, meals, flights, and other related expenses. These costs need to be recovered through prize money. But for a majority of lower-ranked players, this income is simply insufficient to cover all of their expenditures. It should be noted that the situation is totally different for the golden children of the tennis world, those who have come to dominate the game through the combined power of their talent, work ethic, and luck. As an example, Roger Federer is one of only six billionaire athletes in the world, alongside Tiger Woods, LeBron James, Cristiano Ronaldo, Lionel Messi, and Floyd Mayweather. But even in the case of Federer, the majority of his lifetime earnings have come not from winning tennis tournaments, but rather from a carefully curated set of private advertising and sponsorship deals he was able to strike with a variety of luxury brands such as Rolex, Mercedes, Uniqlo. Same is true for other successful tennis stars, including Novak Djokovic, Rafael Nadal, and the Williams sisters, and a handful of others. But let's return to the Grand Slams. Like most sporting events in the world, organizers of these tennis majors earn money in one of several ways. The first is the income they receive from selling the rights to broadcast their tournament in various countries around the world. Although the exact numbers are hard to come by, 
It is often reported that each Grand Slam is able to secure somewhere in the neighborhood of $100 to $200 million a year from their global broadcast deals. The second major source of income typically comes from the deals that tournament organizers strike with their various advertising partners. Continuing with the 2022 Wimbledon example, this tournament had a total of 16 sponsors, including the likes of Rolex, Ralph Lauren, IBM, HSBC, and Evian. These partners also supply various goods and services throughout the tournament, such as Lavazza being the official coffee provider at Wimbledon. In return, tournament organizers place their partners' logos and other advertising collateral throughout the tournament assets, including in and around the match courts, as part of match broadcasts, as well as their printed programs, websites, tournament apps, and social media accounts. The third source of income is the ticket and concessions revenue from selling access to Grand Slam matches and other related events. As an example, tickets to the 2022 U.S. Open vary between tens to tens of thousands of dollars, depending on the stage of the tournament and the location of the seats. When you add up all the different income sources for the Grand Slams, it is often reported that each tournament is able to generate somewhere around $300 to $400 million per each two-week event. Taken together, the four slams would generate around $1 to $1.5 billion a year, which is quite a considerable amount of money. In comparison, the most recent Soccer World Cup in Qatar in 2022 helped FIFA generate around $4.5 billion of income in that year. Given that the slams happen every year, while the FIFA World Cup is a once-in-a-four-year period event, the two are actually quite similar in how much money they produce over a four-year cycle. Now, one thing we need to address is the frequent-sided notion that tennis is a, quote, broken sport. This notion traces back to the central issue with the economics of tennis, which is the fact that a large majority of professional players aren't able to sustain themselves while playing the game. To understand more how it works, let's compare tennis to some other more sustainable and successful sports out there. Continuing with the soccer example, the way European tournaments, such as the English Premier League, make money is not that different to Grand Slams. Broadcast rights tend to dominate the day, followed by advertising partnerships, match day tickets, concessions, and merchandise income. However, what is different is how the broadcast and advertising money is then distributed among all the participating teams, which makes the tournament possible in the first place. In the Premier League, all 20 participating teams receive the same base share of the league's TV rights, which is somewhere around 80 million pounds per year. Next, there is a performance-based component, with the winner receiving around 40 million pounds more compared to the team that finishes last in the table. Overall, the model ends up being way more egalitarian for everyone involved, compared to what happens at tennis grand slams, where the difference between the top finishers and the also rants is simply astronomical. One of the reasons for this gap is that the prize funds seem to be too small to be able to meaningfully reward and motivate all the participants. As an example, even allocating a $50 million prize fund around 250 or so men's and women's singles participants at a Grand Slam works out to be around $200,000 per player. In today's world of professional sport, this level of compensation simply wouldn't fly. In theory, Grand Slams and other professional tennis tournaments could increase both their income and operating budgets, including the prize funds, but for their central problem of fragmentation. Each of the four Grand Slams is operated as a separate entity, typically ran by the National Tennis Association of the country hosting the event. Not only that, but there are also three other major international tennis associations, namely the ATP, the WTA, and the ITF, each responsible for its own subset of competitions. This makes it a total of seven independent-run professional tennis circuits, with each trying to achieve the same goal promote the sport of tennis globally through organizing tournaments that are worth watching and creating a means for professional tennis players to monetize their talents. The reason why this degree of fragmentation is bad is because in theory, it weakens the bargaining power of tournament organizers when it comes to negotiating both the broadcast and advertising deals with their partners. A given TV network in the US can make do without broadcasting all four of the Grand Slams. As an example, but the situation would be different if all of the major tennis events in a year were only available to buy as a package. That's when it becomes all or nothing. 
and the resulting exclusivity forces a much stronger competition among the bidders, which would help tournaments increase the amount of money they make from organizing these events. Of course, the solution always seems simpler than what it really is. The Grand Slams have been operated the way they are for over a century now, and it is often difficult to break away from the traditional way of doing business. It would take a truly monumental shift to change the way the tournaments are governed, and as of the time of this video, no such event seemed to be on the horizon. There have been some attempts at improving the situation for the players outside the top 200, which typically involves allocating less of the prize money to the top finishers. However, it looks like these efforts have not yet been enough to meaningfully move the dial just yet. In the end, what we can say about the Grand Slams is this. They are still among the biggest, oldest, and most successful sporting events in the world, able to compete for viewers' attention with the most premier live entertainment out there. They have their challenges and inequities, but at least things are starting to move in the right direction, however slowly at first. And hopefully, over the next several decades, by their 200th anniversary, the Grand Slams will have figured out how to make professional tennis into a much more sustainable livelihood for a greater share of their players, which would only do a world of good for the global tennis community.